There's a debate going on in astrophysics right now about one of the most distant galaxies known, GNZ11, which was first spotted by the Hubble Space Telescope in 2015 and for a while was the most distant galaxy known, with the light having traveled 13.4 billion years to get to us, so that we're seeing that galaxy when the universe was only 400 million years old. That is, it was the most distant galaxy known until the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Which spotted many more distant galaxies, including Jade's GSZ13-0, which currently holds the crown. Of course, being the most distant galaxy known at the time of launch for JWST meant that there was a lot of observations of GNZ11 planned for the first year of JWST's operations. Those observations have now been analysed, papers are starting to get published. The problem is, observations haven't been the most clear cut in terms of us figuring out what is actually going on in GNZ11. And now two camps have emerged. One that says from the JWST observations, you can tell that GNZ11 hosts a growing supermassive black hole at its centre. Whereas the other camp says you can't use the observations to claim that at all. Just to add a little bit more drama to the whole affair. One camp, the one arguing that it has a supermassive black hole, is based in Cambridge, and the other camp arguing that it doesn't is based in Oxford. It is a classic Oxbridge rivalry that I'm sure in a few years will be big enough to contend with the boat race. So what data do we have from JWST and what does it show? Well, we have what's known as a spectrum of the galaxy from JWST's near-spec instrument on board, where you take the light from the galaxy and you split it through a prism to get a trace of how much light at each wavelength of light you receive. So how much higher energy, higher wavelengths of light do you get and how much lower energy, lower wavelengths of light you get. And that can tell you so much about a galaxy from how many stars have formed recently, to what that galaxy is made of, to what the supermassive black hole is doing. Because although the supermassive black hole itself does not give off any light, that is the definition of a black hole, we can detect light from the regions around them when they're growing. Material that's orbiting around them and will eventually be like eaten by the black hole to grow it in mass is accelerated to such huge speeds by the gravity of the black hole, it heats it up so that it glows with an enormous amount of energy from X-ray light through to longer radio wavelengths of light. That energy Energy can then impact with atoms of gas that are in the galaxy and the electrons in orbit around the nucleus use that energy to jump up to the next place they can orbit the atom. They eventually drop back down to their original orbit and in the process they give that energy back out again but this time as light at a very specific wavelength that is unique to that element alone and to whatever levels the electron jumped between. So for example, a hydrogen atom can give out light at a very specific wavelength of 656.281 nanometers when the electron jumps from the third to the second orbit level. And it's one of the most common features that we see in spectra of galaxies appearing as this big bump in the light at that wavelength. Now to make hydrogen glow like that from the electron jumping up and down, you don't need that much energy, at least sort of relatively astrophysically speaking anyway. You can do it with the energy that's given off by like newly formed stars or from, you know, the energy given off by the material spiraling around a growing supermassive black hole. It's why it's so common in galaxy spectra that we see, you know, in the universe all around us. But for heavier elements, for things like carbon, nitrogen, even neon, they have much heavier nuclei. And so the electrons are much more tightly bound. And so you need way, way more energy for the electrons to do this jump in the first place and for, to cause those elements to glow. 
It's this emission from carbon, neon, and nitrogen that has been spotted in the spectrum of GNZ11. It was in this paper led by Maialino, Schultz, and collaborators from Cambridge and other institutions all around the world that they reported the detection of these bumps in the spectra from the neon-4 transition, the nitrogen-3, the nitrogen-4 transition, and the carbon-4 transition. And they state that as neon-4 requires requires photons with such high energies, this bump in the spectrum is an unambiguous AGN tracer. AGN here stands for active galactic nuclei, i.e. the thing at the center of the galaxy, the supermassive black hole, is active, it is growing. Now, not only that, they also spotted in the carbon-4 part of the spectrum that they saw it in absorption as well as emission. That's that bump downwards here in this plot, which is also offset from where the emission is happening. It's been Doppler shifted because whatever carbon material is causing this bump downwards is moving. Perhaps because whatever's happening around the growing supermassive black hole in GNZ11 that's producing both this emission and all of these heavier elements, but also this absorption, is actually releasing some pressure in what's known as an outflow from the supermassive black hole. Or I kind of like to think of it as a growing black hole burp. All of that evidence meant that the Cambridge group, led by Maialino, Schultz, and collaborators, concluded that this galaxy, GNZ11, in the early universe, just 400 million years into the universe's lifetime, has a growing supermassive black hole that's around about 1 million times heavier than the sun. And they did not hedge their bets with this claim either. They were very sure of this conclusion. They even titled the paper, A Small and Vigorous Black Hole in the Early Universe. But that is not how the Oxford camp interpreted this data. In this recent paper from Cameron, Katz, Ray, and Saxena, the title didn't even mention the idea of a growing supermassive black hole and instead investigated other potential scenarios that it could explain this neon, nitrogen, and carbon emission in the James Webb Space Telescope observations. What they specifically looked at was the ratio between the amount of light emitted by these different molecules, which can tell you how much of each element relative to each each other anyway there is in GNZ11, which is a really useful piece of information to know about a galaxy in the early universe. Because if you think about it, like in the very early days of the universe, all there was was hydrogen and some helium. And the first stars that formed then fused that hydrogen together to make helium. But then at the very end of their lives, right before they go supernova, they start fusing that helium into heavier elements, which they then disperse across the universe when they do go supernova. So the heavier the element, the longer you have to wait in the universe's lifetime for that element to build up enough to noticeable amounts because you have to produce the lighter elements first to then fuse those together to make the heavier elements. So for example, nitrogen actually builds up a lot quicker in the universe than oxygen does. So by tracing how much of each element you have, you can work out a rough history for how many stars must have formed and died already in that galaxy. And Cameron and collaborators found that the ratio of nitrogen to oxygen in GNZ11 is four times higher than it is in the sun. That is weird, right? There has to be something going on in GNZ11 to sort of overproduce nitrogen versus oxygen in the early universe compared to the ratio that we're used to seeing, you know, now in the universe. One thing that they suggest could explain this anomalously high ratio and also the large amounts of neon and carbon emission you get is if a star swings close to the black hole but doesn't actually get eaten by it to grow it in its mass, instead it just swings by and gets torn apart in what's known as a tidal disruption event or TDE. And that could give rise to sort of distributing more nitrogen than oxygen in GNZ11 and give you that weirdly large ratio. But Cameron and collaborators state there's just not enough evidence to conclude that this tidal disruption event actually happened. And they argue there's still not enough evidence to declare GNZ11 has a growing black hole either, also known as a quasar. Instead, they state the most likely explanation to explain all of these observations of GNZ11 is runaway stellar collisions. 
think about it. The universe was a lot denser back then. So you can imagine a scenario where you had a very dense cloud of gas where you'd form lots of massive stars. And then because they were so close together, they would then get attracted under gravity so that they would collide and merge to form even more massive stars that could then produce a lot of nitrogen very quickly, but not necessarily a lot of oxygen. The energy given out by those very massive stars would then be enough to also cause the elements like nitrogen, neon, and carbon to glow with these very specific wavelengths. Now, although Cameron and collaborators claim this is the most likely scenario to explain the observations we have and also explain why we don't see similar looking galaxies in the nearby universe today, because the nearby universe isn't as dense as it was back then, so you wouldn't get these runaway star collisions. They also hedge their bets a little bit, pointing out the large uncertainties involved in interpreting this data and that they cannot conclusively rule out whether GNZ11 is a growing black hole or not. So where do we go from here? Well, you probably guess what I'm about to say, and it's more observations of GNZ11. With this project led by Colina Robledo from the Astrobiology Center at INTA in Madrid, Spain. This time they plan to observe GNZ11 with the MIRI instrument on board JWST, which detects much longer infrared wavelengths of light. Which because GNZ11 is so far away, its light has taken so long to reach us, traveling through the universe for 13 13.4 billion years, its light has been constantly stretched out by the expansion of the universe. It's been redshifted, what appears to look like a Doppler shift as if the, the galaxy is moving away from us, but it means that the light that was emitted by the galaxy in optical wavelengths is now only visible to us at these mid-infrared wavelengths that MIRI is sensitive to, which means we should then be able to detect emission from things like oxygen and hydrogen, which are the smoking guns of a growing supermassive black hole, at least in the nearby universe when we look at galaxies much closer to us. They really are just like the bread and butter of at least what I do when I study growing supermassive black holes in the nearby universe. So those observations are scheduled for March 2024, and perhaps with that, we might have some answers of whether GNZ11 has a growing supermassive black hole. Look, this is science happening in real time. The kind that we were dreaming of before JWST launched. And what I think is so interesting is that both interpretations of what GNZ11 is have huge implications for our sort of wider knowledge of galaxy evolution and black hole growth in the early universe. I'll link both papers below so you can have a read of them and perhaps make up your own mind over which scenario is more convincing to you. And if you do lean one way or the other, let me know down in the comments below. But I think one thing we can say for sure is that we haven't heard the last of GNZ11 just yet. Before we get to the bloopers, a huge thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Now, some of the topics that I've talked about in this video will seem way overly complicated, but if you break them down into their individual parts, they become so much more manageable. And with Brilliant, there's a fun and easy way to do just that. Brilliant is a website and an app that gets you to learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons across science, maths, and data science, everything from the basics to advanced topics, and with new lessons added every month. Look, a lot of what we just talked about essentially boils down to how to analyze data. And even if you're not an astrophysicist, there's a huge growing demand for data skills, which is why I love their new data analysis fundamentals course. Within a few quick lessons, you get to analyze real data and draw interesting conclusions from it. It's this kind of analysis that forms the backbone of a lot of astrophysics research. So to try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on that link in the video description down below. And the first 200 of you that do are going to get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So thank you so much again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now roll those bloopers. So that we're seeing this galaxy as it was when the universe was just 400 million, million, <laughs> like my neck went like so like, <laughs> I'm going to do that one again. It's a classic Oxbridge rivalry, one that I'm sure will grow to be as big as the boat race in the next couple of years. I don't think anybody believes that, do they? Ugh. 
energy, at least relatively like astrophysically speaking anyway. Eh, we've just got so much saliva all of a sudden and I'm like, eh. We can tell you how much of each elephant, elephant? <laughs> element, not elephant. <laughs> then that could give rise to this anomalously, anomalous, anon, did I say it right? Hang on. Anom, anonymous? No, it's not anonymously high. It's anomalous. Oh my God. What is it? 